We spend our lives caught between two contradictory and opposing truths. The first is that the unexamined life is certainly not worth living. The other is that ignorance is indeed truly bliss. <laughs> it's a paradox. It is our ability to take on the realities that confront us with imagination and reason that allow us to make this existence better through solving problems, correcting injustices, making art. Yet at the same time, I also think that if we spent our days truly immersed in every evil and imperfection that exists in the world around us, we would be overwhelmed with the enormity of the intractable obstacles, injustices, misfortunes, pains, and sorrows that we cannot make all better. This is the great mystery of being a human being alive in this world. And I think this is what the American Presbyterian minister Frederick Beekner meant when he wrote, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. Our very first and primary source of religious inspiration as Unitarian Universalists is what we describe as the transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures which move us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which uphold and create life. It is inside this mystery and wonder, this first religious principle of ours, that faith is born. One of my favorite explanations of this transcending mystery and wonder is Albert Einstein in the reading today. The miraculous and the mysterious are the most magnificent things, most awe-inspiring things we can encounter as human beings. That place where faith is born is the pinnacle of majesty of our experience. That to be able to be held wrapped in awe at the wonder of it all is what it means to be human. Another favorite description for me of this transcending mystery and wonder comes from Trudy the Bag Lady. Remember Trudy the Bag Lady? Lily Tomlin's character in her one woman show from the 1980s titled The Search for Intelligent Life in the Universe. <laughs> and in the show, Trudy the Bag Lady walks around the streets of New York having conversations with entities only she can see. She calls them the space people. <laughs> and she is their personal guide to all things concerning our planet. <laughs> and she says that the space people have a term for this transcending mystery and wonder. And Trudy, of course, translates it only into Latin. They call it awe infinitum. Mm -hmm. Never ending awe. Trudy says in the show, during one of her long stretches of soliloquy, we stopped to look at the stars, and as usual, I felt in awe. And then I felt even deeper in awe at this capacity we have to be in awe about something. And then I became even more awestruck at the thought that I was in some small way a part of that which I was now in awe about. <laughs> and this feeling went on and on and on infinitum. My space chums, in fact, call it awe infinitum. Because at the moment you are most in awe of all you don't understand, then it... And I felt... I decided to set aside time each day just to do aerobics. Nah. <laughs> it's so bad, it's good. Aerobics. I mean, I admit, I love it. 
I put it in the sermon. <laughs> Shouldn't we all do aerobics daily? I mean, our lives would certainly be better for it to make sure there is time every day to just stand aside and be in awe of the wonder of it all. It's probably the best exercise we could all get. How can the transcending mystery and wonder not make you want to work awe infinitum into each one of your days. And this time of year is the time of year for awe infinitum. There are so many cultural and religious celebrations of various types that basically invite us to experience this feeling somehow some way. They invite us to be amazed at the power of one human life, the potential in every child that's born to save the world. We're invited to lose ourselves in the majesty of the universe that from our perspective, the sun this star stands still in our sky instead of moving through it day by day. That for a few days every year, low on the horizon, it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. Is it any wonder our long forgotten ancestors looked up at it and wondered what was going on? Was it all gonna just stop? And then it kept going. And they were amazed. And just because we now know the mathematics and the science and have figured out what's actually happening, what we're seeing, doesn't diminish the spectacle and the wonder of it one bit. We can still look at the sky during the longest night of the year and be amazed and look at that sun low on the horizon, the days leading up to and after it, and just be held in a place of wonder and awe. We are invited into a story of how one little tiny bit of a resource lasts for eight days instead of one. Description I saw about Hanukkah this week on social media was, imagine if your cell phone was at 10% battery life and yet still work for the next eight days. <laughs> we would be in awe. <laughs> would we not? And it would be miraculous. And we would be caught up into the what's going on here of it all. Even though this transcending mystery and wonder, even though awe infinitum itself is our first and primary religious and spiritual source in our tradition, my experience is that a lot of Unitarian Universalists miss it completely, unfortunately. In fact, some even just run away from it, which I hope will change for them and for all of us. And one of the reasons I think this happens, one of the reasons I think that it can be very difficult for some people to enter into the awe infinitum is because this draws us full-fledged into that emotive and spiritual part of ourselves where things we know and feel are so, even if we can't explain them rationally or scientifically as fact. because our first principle almost requires a suspension of disbelief. It can require extreme humility and the admission that there is so much we do not yet know. It requires removing ourselves from the center of the universe. It requires giving ultimate importance to things that we cannot scientifically prove. Or, 
that we sometimes can't even articulate or put into words. I, as a Unitarian Universalist, and by, in a sense, another article of our covenanting, do put extreme confidence and faith and trust in human reason and science. They do save us from idolatries of all kinds. But, and this is a big but for us as Unitarian Universalists, human beings are not reasonable creatures. <laughs> Have you seen who's president? <laughs> We are not reasonable creatures. We are emotional creatures. One of the ways I know this is the way people who are so committed to reason, they get very emotional in their condemnation of all religion and spirituality. Wait a minute. <laughs> when all is taken together as a whole, we are at best multifaceted beings. Our reason mingles with our emotions. The ineffable human spirit and all of it mixed together into our embodiment as physical entities. Pico Iyer says, the opposite of knowledge is not always ignorance. It can be wonder or mystery, or possibility. And in my life, I found it's the things I don't know that have lifted me up and pushed me forward much more than the things I already know. Trudy, the bag lady, would definitely agree. And this time of year is full of the wrestling matches between knowledge and wonder. Mystery and possibility and fact and awe infinitum. And the arena, the wrestling mat, the playing field between our reason and our physicality and our emotion and our spirit and awe infinitum usually turns out to be art and song and poetry, and philosophy, and theology, and dance. For these things are born of the struggle between all the different facets of ourself encountering the universe we live in. Our job is to realize that the transcending mystery and wonder is really the stuff of symbolism, and allegory, and poetic license because there is no other way to explain these things. Because writing an, an expository essay outlining our dealings with awe and wonder, most of the time isn't going to cut it. But I'm giving it my best shot this morning. <laughs> the Hanukkah story asks us to remember how God made a miracle and made one night's worth Oil for a temple lasts eight nights. Knowledge and reason, first of all, beg us to prove who's this God thing that made this miracle. And what about the physical laws of the universe that say that much matter cannot just magically expand into more matter to last more days? And if you're stuck there, you're missing the whole point. There was enough for people who thought they had little. And these people were in a situation not so unlike our own this winter solstice season. Their most sacred place, the temple, had been occupied by an invading foreign army, the Seleucid Greeks. And their local ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, in a place where no images of the divine are supposed to exist, set up a statue of himself. Sound like anyone you know? <laughs> Would be surprised to see this season, you know, Lincoln's memorial replaced with some orange skin something. <laughs> 
but they survived this oppression. They ended up having enough of the resources they needed. And they overthrew those occupiers who denied their personhood, their existence, their self-determination. <coughs> Christmas asks us to remember how a virgin impregnated by a spirit gave birth to the only son of God and how angels appeared in the sky to a bunch of shepherds and foreign kings and astrologers journeyed from somewhere in the east following the light of this star pointing down its light onto one specific little cave outside the walls of some forgotten city in the middle of nowhere province of the Roman Empire. Knowledge and reason begs us to understand that people who are virgins don't have babies, that you're not going to follow the light of anything to that kind of a pinpoint direction, even with Google Maps. <laughs> And that, well, then again, there's this God thing and spirits. And you know, if you get stuck there, no ah infinitum for you. But this story doesn't ask us to think about that stuff. This story is about something else. It's about the mystery and wonder of the power of one life to make a difference beyond imagining for the good that that kind of change for the good comes to the least among us first and most powerfully. When people who first heard this story heard it, when they heard about the shepherds, they got it. Because you know who the shepherds were? Migrant farm workers. Overnight shift workers at the 24-hour McDonald's drive through The shepherds were supposed to lay down their lives and let the wolves kill them, not the sheep. That's how important their lives were. And yet they get the story first, that they are important, and there is hope. And if you're stuck on the other stuff, you never get there. That's the power of that story, and we leave it all out most of the time. These stories of Hanukkah and Christmas are stories of revolution, my friends, against a standing order of powers of this world that are evil and don't care about anyone or anything but the rich and powerful. There's a lot of awe infinitum of inspiration in these tales, which is why we still keep telling them there's a hope and a wonder in them we don't get from other places. And then there's the magic of solstice. We can get lost even in the wonder and the chill down the spine of the equations that tell us exactly what is happening. That in itself is an ever-expanding place of mystery. And oh my God, how do we figure this out? What is this math stuff? I know, what is math? Seriously! <laughs> Right there, there's enough wonder and awe to last you a lifetime. And with it, we explain another wonder and awe. There was a time when people hadn't invented fire yet. Right? We didn't know how to make this stuff. When that light seems like it's going away, we were terrified. And then it comes back, and year after year, and we start to notice the patterns, and we start to figure stuff out. And it leads to us learning about the math and the science that help us explain things. And that is supposed to help us be held in wonder, understanding how some of it works, and the wonder of what we haven't yet figured out and how that might work. This season is so full of awe there's no way we can miss it if we let ourselves enter into the spirit in the least little way. It asks us, this season of awe and wonder, to have a little faith. And faith is not a blind belief in something that seems unreasonable. Faith is where you most deeply put your trust 
that something is so. That hope and love are real. And we will find an answer and we will get out of darkness and we will have enough. Do you trust? Do you have faith in the human potential for doing good? Do you have faith in and trust the science and knowledge that backs up the adage the sun will rise again in the morning? Do you trust in the reality that there really is enough for all of us? Faith is not about believing in miracles that abandon common sense. Faith is not about giving up in science that proves virgins can't give birth to children or that one night's worth of oil can last eight nights. Faith is about trusting in the mystery and wonder of it all. The mystery and wonder of the stars, of human potential, of hope, Trusting in each other. Trusting in these things truly does renew our spirit and put us in touch with things that create and support life. And trusting in these things puts us most deeply in touch with all the things that are most life-giving. Hope. Peace, joy, love. I wish for you, this holiday season, days that are full of all of these things, of wonder and awe. And the next time I speak to you will be Christmas Eve, a night of transcending mystery, wonder, and awe. I hope to see you there.